I apologize for the length of this talk. Better? But uh, the door's going to be locked until we're through. Actually, we're going to give it in two, two, two parts. Um, the, reason, the reason is uh, my excuse is that I gave this first version of this presentation to UVic continuing education. I was given 90 minutes for that. And rather than cutting it down massively, I thought I would just give it to all, all of you. Um, so I'm probably going to screw up when I try. But a little bit about me. Um, we used to sell that mug at the gift store that says, um, warning may start talking about astronomy. But apparently when I was under five, I used to do this and I would never shut up. So um, I'm pleased to be here doing this. Feel free to stop me if you have any questions or if I say anything completely incomprehensible or outrageous. And um, hopefully we can get through most of this stuff because it's actually quite interesting. Let's start off with astronomy from space. Why, would, why do we do astronomy from space? Well, as most of you know, a lot of the um, light from the cosmos doesn't get through the atmosphere. And if you look at this diagram, you'll see um, this is how deep um, light of different wavelengths actually penetrates. Um, so you have two major uh, wavelength ranges which actually reach the ground. Um, the optical window where you can see stars and stuff, and radio window where you can detect radio, radio waves. So we've got um, two different kinds of telescopes, optical and radio, that are placed on the ground. Everything else gets absorbed by the atmosphere, and that's a jolly good thing too because gamma rays are kind of dangerous. Um, in fact, as we'll see, they're the results of explosions, just the ones that are interested. Astronomical satellites are somewhat far away. So, um, two things about astronomy from space is what, why we, we do it, because radiation doesn't reach the Earth. And so we put probes in space, and they have to be in some kind of orbit. So that's an important point. Where where is the craft in an orbit? So there are different kinds of orbits. And um, forget it. I'll just hit the keyboard. First of all, there's low Earth orbit. The low Earth orbit is above the atmosphere. It's the it's the, um, the part of the or the part of the space above the Earth's atmosphere that you can get you could get to with the space shuttle or it's where the space station is. It's where the Hubble Space Telescope still is, and the Chandra Telescope, which we'll mention later. It, if, you put a, if you put a space probe there, a, a space telescope, then you could, in principle, go and catch it and service it, as was well known that the Hubble did. Um, if it's not in low Earth orbit, you can't get to it. Um, the big drawback of low Earth orbit is, um, well, the Earth. Um, so if you observed, people observing um, from the Hubble Space Telescope get given a whole bunch of orbits. You put in a proposal and say, I would like so many orbits to study whatever it is you want to look at. And the problem is that unless you're looking right up or right down, the Earth is in the way for approximately 44 minutes of the time. So you get 54 minutes, whereas it takes Hubble about 96 minutes to rotate around the Earth. So you just don't get all the time. That's a bit of a disadvantage, but it's not the worst thing in the world. You don't have the atmosphere and you can see all these wavelengths that are of interest. Um, other kinds of orbits that everyone knows about? Excuse me. Wrong mouse, there you go. The geostationary orbit, everyone knows about these. Uh, um, first proposed by Arthur C. Clarke of 2001 A Space Odyssey fame. Uh, geostationary satellite stays above the same point on the Earth all the time. It's very useful for communication satellites. It's not that great for astronomy because it doesn't give you that many advantages. Um, and the other kind of orbit that you might know about is orbits around the Lagrangian points. Now, the Gra Lagrangian points are points of um, 
little dip in the gravitational field that is created by the Earth and the Moon combined, or the Earth and the Sun combined. And the idea is that those are stable points, that if you put something there, it stays there, or you put something close to it, it will stay orbiting around it so that you can't, so that it doesn't, um, um, so it doesn't go away, it, 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 it's stable. Um, it's about, they're about, um, I, I, I misspoke here, there's several Lagrangian points, one on the other side of the Earth from where the Sun is, and there are a couple uh, before and after the Earth, the orbit, and they're all slightly different distances. The, the reason I put 1.5 million kilometers away is the L2 point, which is where the James Webb Space Telescope is, is about that distance, four times the distance to the moon. Um, and of course, because it's back there, the Earth is tiny at that distance and doesn't block observations. Still, um, you'll see the JWST, the James Webb Telescope, orbits around that point to avoid the Earth even more. So those are the kinds of orbits we might be in. And um, what happens when I push this button? So I just want to remind you something about space. Space is big. <laughs> space is really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big space is. I mean, you think it's a long way around the road for the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Listen, let me tell you. You know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and amazingly first published in 1979. The reason I put this here is to remind you not just that space is big, but the number of space observatories is also big. And here is a bunch of them as far as I could list. Um, I used to work at the, as my slide said, at the High Energy Science Archive in at NASA Goddard, and their website nicely lists all these past missions that they know about, that they archive, and all the current missions that they're also doing. And then I had to add a whole bunch of others which are not high energy, um, or some of them are, but yeah, yeah and, and this is not complete. So three questions about space observatories. Why do we mainly think of Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in 1990 as a as where most space astronomy comes from. And the reason is because it kind of, first of all, it was the biggest optical space telescope put in space to that point. And the other thing is it kind of coincided with the technology that you have in your cell phones of being able to produce at fairly uh, high resolution images. So Hubble is a great imager and it's anything that was produced, any telescope that was produced after about that time with imaging capability, um, produces great pictures and great pictures make good TV, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other questions, well, how many active missions are there right now? Um, this web page um, says NASA.gov doesn't just cover what NASA is doing, but it covers what it's doing with the European Space Agency, with the Japan, Japanese Space Agency, the Korean, etc. And anyone want to guess how many active missions there are at the moment? Well, a couple of thousand is too many, but um, I counted 97. And um, all right, so that's how many active space missions there are. Now, the other question about this is, um, how many future missions are planned? 23. Actually, the answer I counted is 41. But good try. Nice prime number. Um, yeah, so there's a lot planning. Uh, uh, some of these you will certainly hear about because they are going to produce big, nice pictures for, the, for, for TV and the press and social media and so on. But others are going to... Um, others are going to... Uh, collect data that's much more interesting to scientists. Um, so, so you get the idea. I'm going to talk about eight uh, missions, um, past and present. Um, and because space is really big and space astronomy is really big, that, that will exhaust the time several times over. So, um, let's try. I'm going to start off. What I'm what I what I'm trying to do is to say it's not just 
exciting, pretty, spectacular pictures, but we can actually do real science and really under and corroborate the laws of physics as we understand it using space observations. And I, I want to illustrate this in a couple of ways. Um, there is actually a slide with some equations on, but I will try and flip over that as fast as I can. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the craft exploring the early universe, um, which are which is one of the major, of course, um, evidence for the Big Bang theory. Um, there were there were three satellites that did that, and they the results are actually quite spectacular. Um, we're going to talk about NASA's great observatories, of which everyone knows about Hubble, but there were three others. Um, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope in order of wavelength. So the most energetic stuff that records explosions in space, hot objects in space, Hubble Space Telescope you know about, the Spitzer, which was an infrared mission that was kind of like a forerunner to James Webb. And then I'm going to talk about James Webb. And we're going to put them all together and see how they augment each other. OK, so let's talk about early, exploring the early universe. Way back at the beginning of the 20th century, everyone's heard about Edwin Hubble, but he was preceded by a, uh, an, an American astronomer called Desto Slipher. And Slipher discovered, about 10 years before Hubble produced his results, that these spiral clouds, nebulae in space, were redder and smaller. The, the, the redder ones were smaller. Um, so think about this. You've got an observational problem. How do I understand this? At the time, you have to realize we didn't know that the galaxies were outside the Milky Way. They, that had not been conclusively demonstrated. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, at the time, the 19s, um, the objects in space were divided into two things, stars and nebulae, which means clouds. And so there were nebulae that were spiral. There were nebulae that looked round, which were called planetary nebulae. There were amorphous gases that looked like clouds, you know, the ones you see in the sky. They were all clouds of some kind. But so Slipher was looking he noted that the spiral nebulae that were smaller were also redder. And he theorized that they were actually galaxies, that they were like, and, and the further they were, um, the smaller they were means they were further away because they looked smaller in the sky and they were redder because they were running away, moving away from us um, as illustrated uh, using the Doppler shift. So that was the state of the art in about 1917. 1920, there was a big debate about whether these things were inside or outside the galaxy, and the battle was won by the people who said, yes, they're outside our galaxy. So that's when 1920, we first knew this, um, or established this. In the meantime, Albert Einstein, who we'll talk about quite a bit later, uh, came up with the theory of general relativity, which is universal gravitation. And um, a fellow called Lemaitre, who was actually, he was, a, he was a Catholic priest, somewhat against his will. He always wanted to be a physicist. It reminds me of that um, Gary Larson cartoon you might have seen, which has this picture of someone in a clown suit and the supervisor is saying, What's this? Physics equations? Don't you enjoy your job as a cartoonist here? Um, so he didn't really want to be a priest, but he wanted to be a physicist. And he took Einstein's theory, and he knew about Slipher's observations, and he said, I think the whole universe expanded from a point, which was very hot. So he talked about primeval Adam. And he used general relativity, which was a fringe theory at the time, and well, by 27, it's sort of been demonstrated, but it was not accepted by everybody, particularly not the Nazis, because Albert Einstein was Jewish. They actually produced a booklet um, that was um, authored by 100 German 
Einstein to tell how wrong Einstein was. And uh, Einstein responded with, well, if I was wrong, it only, would only take one, wouldn't it? Anyway, um, other astronomers, particularly a fellow called Fred Hoyle, who I had the pleasure of meeting about 30 years, 40 years ago, um, found the idea and said, cool, that's a stupid theory. It's, it's just, just a big bang, right? And actually, somehow, the name stuck. Um, Hoyle preferred something called the steady state theory, which was about um, the idea that matter continuously appeared throughout the universe at some rate, and that explained all of the fact that there were there was matter in the first place, of which there was absolutely no observational evidence no, ever. Um, but as we will see, that there, there started to become a lot of evidence that the Big Bang, so-called Big Bang, was actually right. In 1929, Hubble's uh, data, Hubble was a great rival to the people who were working at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. He discovered the expansion of the universe. They discovered the rotation of the galaxy here about the same time. Um, Hubble confirmed Slipher's discovery, and he quantified it. The residual heat from the Big Bang was predicted. So, you know, if everything blew up from a point, then the residual heat should be there still. And so radio astronomers um, postulated this in about 1941. And this was discovered as a sort of background hum in all directions in 1967. And the subsequent story is one of the great triumphs of space astronomy. So let's talk about it. So the space astronomy has confirmed that the hot Big Bang theory is probably directly supported by evidence. Distant, distant galaxies are moving farther and faster. And Einstein's theory of universal gravitation called general relativity is, has passed every single known test. Um, and we'll, we'll see some dramatic pictures of that shortly. Um, Okay, so, all right, so there is Penzance and Wilson. 1941 was the original uh, discovery, a postulate of the, of the hot Big Bang in 1967, they actually found it. And then there were three satellites. Hey, we finally got to space astronomy after how many minutes? Uh, all right, uh, NASA's cosmic background explorer, COBE, the WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, and the Planck Telescope. Now, um, so let's, this is physics 201, all right. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is black body radiation? Black body radiation is the radiation put out by a perfect radiator. And the electromagnetic theory of the 19th century um, predicted that if um, their theory was correct, then you would get a total catastrophe in the ultraviolet, that it predicted that the amount of radiation radiated go to infinity, this curve here. Along came a fellow called Max Planck, and Planck said, but what if you couldn't just emit energy at all, emit energy at all, all um, uh, quantities? What if it was quantized? What if you could only have energy packets at certain um, discrete intervals? Um, he showed that if you did that, if you assumed that, then you would get a curve like this of the energy radiated by a black body as a function of wavelength, and it would go not over to infinity, but back down again. So this is called the black body curve, but it's called the Planck curve. And Einstein came along a few years later and said, well, actually, um, I have an observation that I can explain by this hypothesis too, and this is what Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. He didn't win his Nobel Prize for his most famous work, Relativity, because of, well, partly because of the Nazis again. Now, um, so why am I talking about this now? Well, because one of the things that COBE, the first satellite, did was to try and um, measure the radiation from the cosmos and see whether it fit the pattern. And it had an instrument called FIRAS and an instrument called DMI. It had other instruments as well, which we're going to talk about quickly. Um, first of all, so the FIRAS observations measured the 
essentially the, the radiation coming out at each wavelength to try and match the black body curve. And what they found was this. So these are the error. Oh, sorry. Mm. sorry. I hate it when I have this. These are the error bars. And that line is a theoretical curve. It's a perfect fit, apart from slight deviations at the one at the less than 1.7. Those are the error bars. The actual deviations are even smaller than that. But this showed that the radiation from the cosmos was indeed um, a black body. It has a specific temperature, we'll see in a minute. And it is really precisely matched. That's nine minutes of data. So if you looked at the whole sky from Kobe, you got, well, <laughs> isotropic. It's the same everywhere. So this big orange blob represents the entire sky. They map that radiation in every direction, and that's what they got. Yes, sir. Um, a black body is a perfect radiator. So it's something that radiates exactly what it's been. Uh, it it um, reflects perfectly exactly what it's been, um, what, what's sent at it. Um, it's also... Um, if you have a perfect thermal source, like a, you know, it's it's radiating at, it, it it's a 500 degrees, say, it will have a characteristic curve, which is called the black body radiation curve. So, you have to do physics two or one again. Um, so if the, um, so this is this is what the radiation from the entire sky looks like. It's all orange, and you don't see anything you don't see any deviations. So the idea is the field is isotropic. It looks in which direction you're looking at. Now, um, if you subtract out that part of it, so it says this is a black body at 2.728 degrees, just over, just under three degrees above absolute zero. If I now subtract out the main part of the data, what, what's left in the COBE data is this. And that shows what's called a dipole. It's, it's, it shows that the spacecraft is moving in a certain direction, and that direction is the direction the Earth is moving in space. Okay, well, that's at the level of three, three thousandths of one degree. That's the um, amplitude of those variations. But if I subtract out the Earth's motion, what I get is this. And what this is, the big orange blob in the middle is our galaxy, the Milky Way. And what you see is a collection of patches, which are at about 18 micro Kelvin, one 18 millionths of a degree. And they seem to correspond to some actual real deviations from that black body spectrum. Now, so what could those deviations mean? Um, the, the basic idea is that, well, think about what this represents. It's the radiation field from the Big Bang. So what would happen if it wasn't quite uniform? Well, you might, it might indicate that there are, there are clouds of energy out there. So these anisotropies become really quite interesting because they're talking about the formation of galaxies and cl galaxy clusters. So they sent up another probe called Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe to try and investigate those. And what they saw was this. And this is the pattern of anisotropies of the, the entire sky. And you see there are these little variations that correspond later to the formation of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And they sent another probe after that, the Planck probe, which is aptly named because he's the guy who started it all. And as they got there, all you got was further and further refinement. So that, that uh, black, those gray lines, that's, the, um, the, that's our galaxy. And you see more and more detail in this map of slight variations in the background that were, again, related to slight perturbations in the energy field in the early universe that in turn are likely to correspond to galaxies and galaxy clusters we see today. So, yes, sir. Yeah. 
so if you look there are the blue there are the blue patches um, and the blue patches are where the radiation field appears to be lower than the average right and so that would be similar to a void um, but um, trying to interpret that in terms of what it actually means has been I think a little difficult um, there were people who said well maybe this is some of these voids are a sign of the multiverse that there are other universes outside ours but that has not yet been confirmed unfortunately all right so we're going to leave this topic and go to NASA's great observatories you all know about the Hubble Space Telescope the Hubble Space Telescope um, covers wavelengths from the far ultraviolet to the near infrared the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which flew from 1991 to 2000, detects essentially explosions in space. Um, the Chandra X-ray Observatory X-rays hot objects in space, and the Spitzer Space Telescope um, is for monitoring gas and dust and other interesting things. So interesting that they put up a much bigger telescope to do the same thing, um, which you're aware of now. Now, um, I am going to... Part one of this talk is going to go through this part. Let's talk about the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. CGRO um, was there to detect explosive events in the universe. And w one of the ways it arose was the Americans had to put up, the US put up probes into space to monitor Soviet nuclear detonations. And so those were, those were gamma ray that they would detect gamma rays for space whenever someone did a nuclear test. I discovered that the sky, there, there, were, there were gamma rays coming from other than Russia. <laughs> so they thought, oh, this is interesting. What on earth are these things? And so they, um, they uh, then put up uh, CGRO, and CGRO detected... Um, had several detectors, and I, I don't know what happened to my slides here, but you know, there's a, it likes to put the T on. Anyway, um, so the interesting thing was the BATC, the Burst and Transient Sort Experiment on, on, on the spacecraft, detected gamma ray bursts all over the sky. And think about it, here we are in the galactic plane. So we're in the Milky Way, we're sitting on one of the, what Douglas Adams called one of the more unattractive spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, but we're not anywhere, we're, we're, we're in a flat plane. Um, our sky is filled with stars, even though we're in a flat plane, because those stars are close by, they're the ones immediately above us. And below us in the galactic plane, but if you look at the entire sky, you see they, they, 2,700 of these uh, perths, they're from all over the place, so that means they must be like extra galactic. Um, our stars are distributed not over the whole sky.
in the factors, then I will get a bluer color than uh, from a hotter object. So if I look at if I look at this part of the spectrum and this part of the spectrum, and I subtract the two, I will get one color which is different depending on the temperature of the object I'm looking at. And that turns out to be absolutely crucial in nearly every astronomical observation, except ones that don't look invisible, they don't count. Yeah, right. Okay, so here is, here is a quick digression to continue. An old stellar population, a globular cluster. We show you these from the Pluskett telescope when we get the, when it's a clear night, not like tonight. And um, um, they are satellites of the Milky Way and they are very old stellar systems. If I take those, observations I just mentioned at different color, I can find a temperature and I can also measure a brightness. And for a population like this, I might get a plot like this, which is the plot of brightness against temperature. That's what an old stellar population looks like. Um, on the other hand, if I look like I'm look, look at a new, an, uh, a young stellar population, anyone have an idea what this object is here? It is the Pleiades or Subaru as the Japanese call it. Um, compared to the compared to the population I just saw which looked a bit like the green curve this is what a young stellar population looks like so meaning that young stars are bluer and hot and and more bright and excuse me so that's just a little guide to the way stars behave in terms of age and color. So what I'm going to do is go take you zooming through this, um, zooming through this um, globular cluster. This is a, not the same cluster, it's a different one. But just to show you the resolution of a space, the space telescope, we're going to show you what the sky looks like and, and how well we can actually see these, see the stars in the center of it where we are. Uh, I hate it. All right, let me try that one again. I knew this was going to go on. Uh, okay, thank you. Just give it a moment. It's YouTube. All right. No, that's not, uh, yeah, I, I've seen this problem before. I am, I'm going to do this one more time, then we're just going to move on. Okay, never mind. Here is, here's the final event. This is another Hubble Space Telescope picture of the center of that cluster that I was just trying to show you. That will be more. More, more better if you can see the zoom in. But you see these big red things, those are the red hots, the red bright stars at the top, and these are the blue stars. And you can see right down into the middle, the rest of the background stars are just also in color of yellowish. Um, if I look at a galaxy, here's my, here, here is a, another object we often see in, from the this is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And you see several things about this. First of all, you see yellow in the middle, you see blue stars and red knots. And the red knots are clouds of gas that are about to form stars. And the black lines are gas that is not heated in and is too cool to be in. And just for bonus, this galaxy is in another galaxy. Um, so this is very um, indicative of what, this is very typical of what spiral galaxies look like and shows the various different kinds of population. Now, um, if I want to look at one of those red knots, here is, here is the Orion Nebula. You probably recognize the Vortex Nebula, which is a black cloud in front of red luminous hydrogen gas, gas from Hubble, and a close-up first, what that billowing cloud looks like. 
Um, this is the main nebula. These are stars. This is called the blue, because large, because the, the the hot blue stars are the one that just formed. Um, you've probably seen this picture before, right? I'm gonna. Okay, um, I'm going to show you this one again. This is the, since I'm going to show you this again, I'm going to go past it. This is the um, the Eagle Nebula, the what's being called the pill Pillars of Creation. It's called that because NASA hires some really good copywriters to do their press releases. And so they came up with a name that inspired and enlightened to everybody. But basically, these are clouds of dark matter, not dark matter as in the they're, 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 they're gas that's not not been illuminated and the scale of this kind of thing here about the size of my laser pointer is the size of a planetary disk um yeah um i i think the shape is a bit of an artifact i've seen here it's I, i'm not sure that it's actually moving you know up towards the top of the frame um, so this is called Stefan's Quintet. This is an, you see the same features of the galaxies. Um, these are five galaxies that have been known for over about a hundred years. And these galaxies are, some of them are line of sight and some of them are actually interacting. We'll get back to this thing again because there's some really interesting things about it. Um, and the other, the other thing Hubble did was 1995, Bob Williams, who was the director at the time, said, let's just point it into empty space and see what happens. And he produced the Hubble Deep Fields because he was the director of the observatory. And despite everyone saying this was a waste of telescope time, he could say, it's my, my, uh, my institute, so we're doing it. And everything you see on here is a galaxy. This is pointed into something that has no recognizable features. Looks like blank space, but that's what you have. So finally, a later version of the same, a later version of the same uh, um, project, Deep Field, produced this a very detailed um, set of observations. Nearly everything you see is a galaxy. Everything except the things with spikes. They're called stars. Okay. And finally, we saw gravitational lenses. And the universe wishes you a nice day. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, let's take a break. Gamma rays are just just way way.
So, but if you're unlucky, I might get back to it. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, ultraviolet and X-ray um, astronomy from space. And firstly, Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, which started life as, as many other space telescopes do with much uh, more mundane names. Lyman Spitzer was a noted astronomer who first proposed the notion of a large space telescope, which they named after Hubble. Go figure. <laughs> so <laughs> they named this one the Infrared uh, Space Telescope after Lyman Spitzer. Um, who was famous for um, observations of, um, you know, star forming clouds and so forth, wrote a textbook on it. Anyway, the, Sh the Spitzer Space Telescope, originally the Space Infrared Telescope Facility, CERTEF, was operational from 2003 to 2020. Um, it, in its original um, configuration, it had a lot of coolant. You've probably heard a lot of um, uh, talk in, you know, in things about James Webb Space Telescope about how ho cold it has to be. And that is because infrared light is heat rays. And so you want to make sure that the telescope isn't hot and therefore providing some of the signal. Um, the original mode with the coolant lasted until 2009 and then it operated in warm mode, which um, didn't quite have all the cooling capability there. Um, it it um, <clears throat> has a 85 centimeter mirror compared to 6.5 meters for the James Webb Space Telescope. By comparison, by the way, the the Plaskett telescope here is 1.8 meter and the Hubble Space Telescope is 2.4. It's not all that big, but it's in space. Um, and the skies are a little clearer there than they are in Victoria on a given night. Um, the space, the Spitzer was supposed to be decommissioned in, in 2018, but because JWST, which kind of replaced it, was delayed in its launch, um, it was operating until 2020. Um, it, infrared light um, is emitted by cooler objects, and so you look at things that are cooler. Discs of uh, discs, uh, protoplanetary discs, and planetary nebulae, which we'll talk about again in a minute. Um, so, I want to show you. This is a classic 1970s picture of M104, which was called the Sombrero Galaxy for no particular reason. Um, <laughs> it looks like a, a sort of a, a blob, a, a, a spherical blob with a black line around it, so a bit like a Mexican hat. Um, but I'm going to show you this as taken by Hubble Space Telescope. Looked like that, which is beautiful. That blob turns out to be not really a blob. And that's just bad, bad resolution, but you can see you can see that in the middle, there's, there's the, the nucleus of the galaxy is a bit bright on the outside. And there's a magnificently resolved dust lane on the outside of the galaxy. And so you've seen these dark clouds and some of the other things I've showed you. Um, this is one which is almost completely edge on. And as I've indicated in the optical, it looks black or dark. However, it is merely cooler and in the infrared, it looks like that. So you can see the same feature, but it's shining up. Um, because this is infrared, the colors are kind of false, but they, they are relative, if you like, that they're different. The colors are, there are real colors. They're not these colors, but they shine differently at different places. Yes? Um, so our galaxy is approximately give or take, 100,000 light years across. Um, it rotates in 225 million years. And uh, these are fairly substantial. Our galaxy is a fairly substantial spiral galaxy. They're not all the same size. The Andromeda galaxy, we believe, is 50% larger 
two and a half million light years away. So if you think about it th that way, um, if you, you, you may have seen the Andromeda galaxy. It's a splotch in the constellation of Andromeda, which you can see through a small telescope. You can see it with the naked eye. It's the most distant object you can see. It's two and a half million light years away. And all you can really see is the nucleus. You can't see the outside of it at all. But um, you think about that, it, that about 120 or so, given this a bit bigger, thousand light years across, is dwarfed by the distance between us and them. Um, there are galaxies that are very small, um, only a few tens of thousands of light years across. Um, and then there are ones that are way bigger than this too. Um, there are galaxies which are several thousand times mass. Um, they're giant ellipticals. Um, didn't really have anything about those here, though. Okay, so, all right. So um, here's Andromeda in the visible and the infrared. And again, um, this, is the, this is a picture most people are used to seeing. And the thing you can see with the naked eye is about the size of my laser pointer. It's right in the middle. But if you could see the Andromeda galaxy, it's too faint because it's too far away. But if you could see it, it would be six times the width of the full moon. It's really quite big, but you can't. It's also a long way away. This is what it looks like in the infrared. This is actually not the Spitzer telescope. This is a different ultra um, infrared telescope, but you can see how its spiral arms carry those dust lanes that shine in the infrared, in infrared light. Um, ooh. I, uh, getting short of time, so I thought I would just show you all of these together. Here's a bunch of Spitzer observations. Again, Spitzer launched in um, 2003, um, was in the age of um, image, Im imaging telescopes with great uh, resolving power. We will see these some of these again. This is the Crab Nebula, which we'll talk about a bit. This is a planetary nebula. So called not because it has anything to do with planets, actually a dying star. We'll get to that. Uh, various star forming regions, which have gas clouds that shine in the infrared. Uh, supernova remnants. And this is uh, another spiral galaxy in the infrared, like the one you just saw. Um, and this is a whole galaxy face on. So another galaxy face on. We will see things. Beautiful thing, examples of that from James Webb in a few minutes. So that's what the Spitzer did. It really was a good instrument for telling us how dramatic and how different things can be in the, in the longer wavelengths. Now, um, let's go to Chandra. So Chandra was another, Chandra Seka Subramanian was a Chandra Seker was a pioneer in the study of black holes and in um, dying stars. In fact, there is a, an important discovery he made that if a star collapses, it can only, core can only be so massive before it can't stop collapsing. And if it can't stop collapsing, it may turn into a neutron star, which we'll talk about in a minute, or a black hole. Um, but that the limit of the mass is named after the sky. So he was very instrumental in the study of very hot objects, dying stars, the hot objects. And they call the observatory originally AXAF, Advanced X-ray Astronomy Facility. They called it the Chandra Observatory. And it's still up there now. And I heard a news flash the other day that the U.S. is thinking of just decommissioning it next year. Budget cuts, you know. There are more important things to do. Anyway, um, so X-rays are from hot objects. Um, but everyone knows that when they go to the hospital, that if you fire X-rays at things, they tend to go through them, because that's what we use X-rays for. So how do you observe X-rays from space? Well, I thought it was important to, or interesting to mention this. You do it by some kind of grazing incidents. So the, here's, the, here's the space satellite here. Um, the detectors at the back, the mirrors are down the side. And the x-rays come in from space. And they, there's these four surfaces, which they glance off and focus onto the detectors at the back. So it operates quite differently from 
um, from the way an optical telescope was. I didn't talk about the gamma ray observatories, but they're basically scintillation counters. You know, they're they're trying to they're trying to detect cosmic rays from space. And uh, um, one of the problems I mentioned earlier on with gamma rays is that you it's very difficult with that kind of detector to figure out where they came from which is why they had to put up a satellite to find out. Anyway, so this is, this is, Chandra, this is how X-ray uh, detectors work. And um, around when I started getting interested in this kind of thing, they discovered um, this very hot object in space called Cygnus X1. This is not, I'm afraid, a real picture. It's a artist impression, but this is a black. Cygnus X1 is one of the first objects that was um, deduced to be a black hole, a stellar mass black hole, to be contrasted with galactic centers, which have supermassive non-stellar mass black holes, like millions of stellar, ma st stellar masses. But this is the picture that you start up with two massive stars, massive stars um, explode and their centers collapse into black holes and you're left with one massive star and a black hole. And the black hole is very strong gravity and it strips off mass from the other star. And a black hole the size of the sun would be, because it's collapsed, any guesses? It would be three, three kilometers across. So you're taking mass about the size of the mass of the sun and condensing down into an area which is three kilometers across. It gets very hot and it emits x-rays. Um, so that, that was what, why it was deduced to be a black hole because it emitted a lot of x-rays of the right kind. And the other possibility for a massive star collapse is it will turn into a neutron star. And we've got direct evidence of this. Um, so Mr. Chandrasekhar, who discovered the limit to how much, st how massive stars could be before they could no longer stop collapsing, um, that was about white dwarfs, um, which are bigger, only a thousand miles across, not three. Um, neutron stars are about 10 kilometers across. I know I'm, I'm, I'm switching units here. Um, I've seen these, I've seen these uh, posts on Facebook that talk about giraffe lengths as units, which are even funnier. But anyway, uh, neutron stars were first discovered in 1967, seen as periodic pulses in radio, radio waves. And um, they were um, so periodic that they thought they discovered aliens who were had clocks that were clocky, ticking at us. But they later discovered that they were magnetic stars that were pointing radio waves at us. And in, oh, must have been around 1972, they discovered the first one in the optical. So these things are real. Um, they, they ended up, uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you this in a few minutes, but these stars, that spin um, 30 times a second. They're about 10 kilometers across. They weigh between one and two solar masses, one and two times the size of the mass of the sun. And they are so magnetic that all the light comes out of the magnetic poles. And so they'd like have a searchlight beam that comes towards us. Um, because they're so magnetic, they may have things like star quakes that um, follow the magnetic lines, and, oh dear, sorry about that, um, very, very dense, very strong magnetic field. So um, those are the kinds of things that Chandra was uh, going to look at. Hot objects, hot stellar remnants, um, but they also discovered serendipitously that galaxy clusters have lots of X-ray light as well. Let me show you, this is the Arbel Five, this is a cluster. There's a fellow called Arbel, Arbel who catalogued clusters. This is Arbel 520. I guess it was a 520th one he found. Um, what I'm going to do is show you, hopefully, if, if this works, a little movie of the various different lights that is coming from this cluster. Is it going to work? Yes. All right. So that's in the optical. And this is the X-rays that are coming off of it. And this is diffuse light caused by 
the mass. So that that blue that blue um, cloud traces the mass in the cluster, um, and it's distorted. It's distorted uh, by the, the by the material. So you've you've all heard about dark matter, and the fact that galaxies and tend to seem to have more matter than they they um, uh, they look like in, in the visible. Well, some of that matter that is dark is traced by X-ray light. And these, um, these pink clouds here are detected by Chandra only. So this was kind of unexpected. You put up a probe that was designed to look at hot stars and you find X-ray light from distant, ga distant galaxy clusters between the galaxies. So this is the Crab Nebula. Now I'm hoping this is going to work this time. I'm going to show you a little movie. The Crab Nebula um, is one of the objects we also observe with Plaskett on a good night. Um, is the remnant of a, a supernova explosion that was observed in the year 1054. There were four, and some people say six, supernovae that were seen from Earth in the last thousand years. And this one in 1054 was noted by the Chinese. It was bright enough to cast shadows during the day. And what is le and, and this is what's left of it now. And let's see what happens when I push this button. This is a little 3D visualization. There's going to be a plug for NASA's visualization lab that I'm not going to uh, that I'm going to spare you. But hopefully. What happens if I push this button is nothing. Oh, no, that's not it. Excuse me. We can cut that for a moment while I mess with this. It was working five minutes ago, I swear.
That's kind of nice. But the, the amazing thing about that is all of that gas emissions, that's all we know exactly how old it is. It's less than There's one single vision years that old. anyone can use to improve vision. So you can say <laughs> Just to fate, I'm just going to... I want, did want to show you that other movie that was immediately afterwards, and I, I have no confidence, so I'm going to look. Yeah, right. Ah, oh, what is it? This one. Oh, sorry. It's the right picture, though. Um, let's see if it comes up in my slide, because it's short. Um, I bet it works. Yeah. Hey, it works now. Anyway, you've, you've, this is actually a different In the year 1054 so AD, so I'm not gonna show, Chinese I'm not gonna Skywalker put you through that again. We've seen this. Nova, the explosion of a massive 
star. But this is what I did want you to see. Hopefully this will come. This is time-lapse photography from Hubble of the same. Ah, it works good. All right. You can actually see, you can actually see the pulsar swishing around. Pretty amazing. I don't know how long they took, but um, given that the pulsar's rotation period is 33 milliseconds, um, they could have done it very quickly. Okay, so I'll talk about this in a minute. I just wanted to mention 33 milliseconds for a pulsar is not the record. The record is about six. There are actually these stars that are swishing around I know, 160 times a second. So, in, in, but by way of introduction to this section I have on James Webb Space Telescope, this is a Crab Nebula. Again, you've seen this picture from Hubble. And on the right-hand side is the picture from the James Webb Space Telescope. And what I want to point out, you can't really see in the optical picture from Hubble, but here, you can actually see in the infrared that pulsar disk faintly. So you see right where it is. And that's a good introduction to the power of looking at things at different wavelengths and with bigger telescopes. So James Webb Space Telescope. So I had a friend at NASA who was asked in about 1996 to join a new project called Next Generation Space Telescope. And he recently told me that uh, he thought he took it up at the time because he thought that, yeah, well, this is something I could do until I decide what to do with the rest of my career. And he's there commenting on the amazing James Webb Space Telescope just after launch in the movie that you can still see at the Royal BC Museum so there are people working on this telescope since 1996. It was called Next Generation Space Telescope. Then it was renamed James Webb in 2002, if I remember correctly. Um, various, again, lots of naysayers, lots of people saying, well, they can't do what they intended to do, and what they do is totally impossible with all these failure modes. I think the number of failure modes, things that could go wrong on the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope was about 420, but nevertheless, they did it. And in fact, it uses less fuel than they planned to, to get it to orbit and in the right place, and it's probably therefore going to last longer than they planned. So all of that is good. Um, the telescope was originally going to be launched in 2011. It was, they envisaged a 10-meter telescope, which would have sensitivity all the way through to the ultraviolet. Um, that got de-scoped. The mirror got uh, shrunk in size. One of the big limitations, of course, is they had to fold it up to put it in a rocket because it is 6.5 meters, which is quite big, 20 feet, roughly speaking. Um, so about nine times the collecting area of the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, you know, we mentioned Lagrange two orbits. Um, the, it's in this orbit, which is beyond, um, beyond the Earth, along the, Earth, the Sun-Earth line. It is orbiting around the Lagrange two point, which is the stable point in the gravitational field of the Earth-Sun combined. And it orbits around, it misses the, misses the Earth, and the Earth is never in the way. Um, just because I have this picture up, um, there's a point between Sun and the Earth, sort of a triangular point, which is called L1 and L3, sorry, L3 and L4, two other Lagrangian points, which are just ahead of the Earth in Earth's orbit and just behind it. And what happens there is asteroids accumulate because they're stable points. And we are um, sending a probe to the, they're called the Trojan asteroids because they're all named after Trojan war heroes. And, um, we are, we sent a probe up to the Trojan asteroids 
um, last year called Lucy. And we're going to have one of the Lucy team come and talk to us in July. So look out for that July 27th. Just the only tie in is the Lagrange points, uh, but nothing to do. So that's one of one of the one of the missions that is um, active at the moment. So everyone knows that JWST has uh, hexagonal mirrors tessellating together, 18 of them. Um, big telescope mirrors now are all designed like this. They use computers to keep them in perfect optical shape. The European Southern Observatory is building the very the extremely large telescope it's underway at the moment in this in chile and it is going to consist of 798 such mirrors not in space but still pretty amazing nevertheless um I, i'm not going to spend too much time on this but i just wanted to mention so the the the, the, the space telescope mirrors from james webb they are sensitive out into the far infrared, uh, well, it's called the near infrared, but from the point of view of visible, it's a lot further into the infrared. If you look, if you look at the bottom of the scale, the wavelength is, um, that is a micron is, um, uh, th this point 0.5 is about the middle of the visible. So all the filters that you can see through, what these are is this is a transmission of the filters. So you, you're, you're seeing light shine through a filter that responds like that, and so you see light only where the curve is above the axis there. Um, just to make a little bit more sense of that, um, if I go back to, oh, actually, I did put it here, didn't I? Hold on a sec. Silly me. Yeah, um, so from what I'm trying to say is, that uh, here's one micron. Um, so the James Webb Space Telescope is seeing light that's emitted out here. So not um, so things that radiate very cool at very low temperatures. They um, have light as a function of wavelength that looks like that. So you're seeing things that are cooler than 3,000 degrees with significant radiation over there. Okay, so this is a bit of CanCon. This is the fine guidance center and the near infrared instrument and sort of spectrometer. This is the thing that makes James Webb's point built in Ontario. So this is the Canadian contribution to the to the mission. See? It says so. It must be true. No, it is. Um, so the primary instruments that you see released by NASA give you pictures taken by the US instruments, which are not this one. But this is nevertheless the Canadian contribution. And if it wasn't for FGS, it would not be able to point in the right place. So this is good. Um, let me go through put this. So talk about resolution. I think may, you may have seen this slide or something like this when the, the, the mission was first launched. This is a progression of different different infrared telescopes. This is Spitzer, an image of Spitzer, and someone has cleverly lined up the same view of the sky through on three different infrared telescopes from space, and this is James Webb. And um, these spikes, they're caused by the structure of the telescope, so they're not real. They're called diffraction spikes, but the fact that they are close, so sharp and resolved tells you this thing is really, really in focus. Um, so I'm now going to show you the different web telescope instruments reveal different things in different galaxies. You see this galaxy, this is the near infrared and this is the mid infrared. So at cooler, uh, at a longer wavelengths, this whole galaxy is more or less missing. All you see is the center. This is called the cartwheel galaxy. Again, astronomers are very imaginative in their names, but you see this, the, 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 uh, the point is Miri shows very cool gas and somewhat heated, like the, like the dust ring in the sombrero I showed, showed you earlier. This is the same thing face on. And here is a, a, a little 
animation of the difference between Hubble and Webb. So that's Webb, that's Hubble looking at the same thing. So you, you see different things. You see things illuminated that are just not visible in the Hubble data. I love this picture. This is a galaxy which has been merged in across a diagonal. On the lower side is Hubble image, and on the upper side is a web image. So you can see here's a spiral arm with the black dust lanes, and in the web data, it's all illuminated. So you see how the, the, the data in different wavelengths gives rise to different understanding of the same kinds of structures. Um, so this is, this is a fairly recent, I think this came out in February. This is a James Webb mosaic of multiple different spiral galaxies. And you can see the different, called the Phantom, Phantom Galaxy, M674. You, you see how the, how the gas and dust, the cool stuff, lines up across spiral arms. And you see the different features of the spiral arms in, in the kind of intricate detail that you can't see at other wavelengths. So you could actually make wallpaper out of this kind of thing. Um, so when it comes to deep space, this is another little animation. This is a Hubble picture of a cluster, a cluster of galaxies that's very deep in space. And again, the thing about galaxies is that anything that's not actually got spikes is actually a galaxy. Some of them are nearly spherical, elliptical, and some are more spiral. Um, and the other thing you see is these little traces, and those are actually the results of gravitational lensing. They're actually um, the distortion of space and time uh, predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, if I put this slide, it's going to slide over and show you what the same field looks like in from James Webb Space Telescope. And you can kind of see why some people wanted to spend a little money on this, um, just to get that. What you see, if I can pause it at one side, oh no, missed, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stupid machine. My mouse slipped. Uh, all right. Well, here's a here's another view. It's a, a it's a different cluster, but it's the same idea. Hubble on the left, Webb on the right. Um, and and you, you see these galaxies nicely resolved. You also see these red streaks that are the um, very distant things that are too faint and too cool for Hubble to see. And the reason why they're too cool for Hubble to see is because um, their light is shifted so far to the red by the fact that they're uh, receding from us that they're out of Hubble's wavelength range. See that this is the same picture and that there are artifacts on the right that are just not there on the left. You also see these, these luminal arcs. Um, they don't only show happy faces to people on Earth. They also really verify the fact that our understanding of gravitation is pretty good. So this is, yeah, I, I feel like, I'm not sure why I'm showing this picture, but I feel like you have to because um, the thing is that the harder things to see, the less in, are to see, the less impressive they are to tele TV cameras. But this is called Maisie's Galaxy, and it is. It, it, I, I believe this came out fairly early on in in the web observations, but it's the furthest object so far discovered, approximately according to our best guess, three hundred million years after the Big Bang. Of course, it probably doesn't look like that if you're a little closer to it. So it looks just like a red splotch. But the thing is that um, you've probably heard in the last few weeks that there seems to be a developing problem about 
um, the web data showing that galaxies seem to be further along in their formation than we expected them to do based on our standard theory. Well, that's fascinating. And no, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to show, this is hopefully, this is actually a movie that's going to work because it's downloaded locally. This is a look at that Stefan's Quintet. Yes. In, from all the spacecraft we've been looking at so far. Deep within the constellation of Pegasus lies a tight grouping of five galaxies. Called Stefan's Quintet. This collection showcases different volume. galaxy types. Volume up, please. And how they can interact in dense environments. Ground based observations show the galaxy arrangement. And the Hubble Space Telescope captures the fine details. Using infrared light, the Spitzer Space Telescope features cool gas and dust. And the Webb Space Telescope unveils new depth and resolution. The Chandra X-ray Observatory reveals a high energy component, both in and between the galaxies. In three dimensions, this spiral galaxy is much closer than the other galaxies. The visible light view shows numerous pink star-forming regions and blue young stars. The infrared view highlights the cool gas and dust amid a diffuse collection of older stars. More distant galaxies are grouped together. These elliptical galaxies are dominated by older stars and have rounded shapes in both infrared and visible light. This barred spiral galaxy has few star forming regions and some irregular spiral arms. Its core contains an active supermassive black hole. Energetic material around the black hole blazes brightly in X-rays. More distant material shines in infrared light. A tidal tail provides evidence of an interaction with this nearby galaxy. This small spiral is part of the group and passed near the larger barred spiral several hundred million years ago. This gap is undergoing a high-speed collision as it crashes into the group from behind. Its shape features distorted spiral arms and stretched out tails with considerable star formation. This X-ray shocked ridge marks where the galaxy is colliding with the dense gas between the galaxies. A bridge of material that extends in front of the barred spiral galaxy can be seen in X-rays. As bright clouds in infrared light and dark clouds in visible light. An encounter with a distant elliptical may have stretched out the spiral before its current chaotic collision.
Stefan's Quintet shows several types of galaxies, including some with stretched and distorted shapes that highlight interactions within the group. NASA's Great Observatories provide multi-wavelength observations that enable diverse insights into this complex, compact group. So, I think I'm going to stop there because it's a little over time. But if this doesn't make the point of how important it is to observe these spaces, so many different parts of the spectrum, I don't know what does. Thank you very much. Yes. So, so apart from the incredible beauty and mystery of all of this, what should it mean to us little specks on this rock? <laughs> I think you just said it. We're little specks on a little rock. Anything more to say about that? Having spent years doing this work? Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, probably, but I'm not sure whether I should say any problem. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to it seems to make the, the everything that goes on the earth pretty irrelevant. The, the idea that we have some. That 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 uh, the idea that any 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 uh, entity that is responsible for all of this could really care about what we do in our lives seems a little ridiculous. Yes, I didn't talk about that. That's right. In terms of merging, um, merging the data from all different observations to actually where a lot of things are. Yeah, I mean, the the, um, the space based observations actually, to be to be honest, the space, they they are in the future. Um, the the it, 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 we're in beginning to scratch the surface of this. In other words, they've detected a few events, um, and largely from radio telescopes from the ground, even though they're very large baselines and so yes. on. Um, but there are, I, I, I've lost track of the various space-based um, gravitational wave detection, but I believe they're not really operational yet. If I'm correct. Point we have a very wide, uh, yeah, uh, Le Lego. Um, yes, but it's not there yet, as far as I know. Um, the, the thing is that gravitational waves, as you know, are not light like all the other things. They are actually, you know, perturbations in the curvature of space. But they, they can be uh, observed coinciding with the yes. events. Yes, indeed. Um, and the events they appear to, they, they, they think that are responsible of the collisions of massive stars, uh, massive condensed objects like uh, neutron stars. Is there another one? I have a question about the cleanup. You said the stations are being decommissioned. Has there been, like, I know there's a lot of junk up there. Are they. Well, the. the, 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 the um, <clears throat> Space telescopes uh, downlink data, and then it has to be processed. And um, when th there's a point to which they are no longer prepared to pay for the infrastructure to downlink the observations and to process it, um, there's not. I, you know, th these are a very small number of things that are in space compared to all the what you might refer to as junk, which is much smaller but much more numerous. And, th and then we have all this, this Starlink stuff as well. 
Um, we had a talk about that last year, which is still on YouTube, from uh, Jonathan McDowell, who studies um, space launches and uh, um, the mega constellations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Will they leave it up there or just shoot it down? It will eventually deorbit. Um, the Gamma Ray Observatory was deorbited and they can control it, but event, um, to make sure it doesn't hit anyone, I think, is probably the, the major goal. So, this says actual size. What is it? This thing. Oh, this. Alouette was Canada's first satellite in space in 1962. It was launched. And it really shouldn't be there. And now our screen is big somewhere else. But yeah, it's been here since the place was opened. 